Welcome everyone to Pontos Fathom Press. You are watching Pontos Fathom Podcast, uh, Episode 7, continuing our Frank Herbert Dune series. Topic today will be Frank Herbert's Dune, Other Memory, Prophecy, and the Psychology of the Future. So we're really going to go deep into, not only into fiction, and how world-building fiction that projects into the future uh, what's the dynamic at play there? But also the looking deep at history and some surprises that come out of some insights, not, not only in the Dune Saga, but across other writers and, and cutting into psychology and uh, into even um, science and religion. So big topic today. Uh, I'm going to just sort of sketch out the idea for everyone. Um, as you guys know, we're... Um, we have the Pontos Fathom Press uh, channel. Would like you guys to check out the link below to Dune Revenant, 20th anniversary of our uh, seventh Dune fan fiction. Be great to support the channel. You can also support us on Patreon, uh, links below, and on our other channel, Pontos Fathom Hobbies, where we do gameplay of similar topics. We're also doing Dune gameplay over there, so check that out if you're interested. So let's jump right in and talk about the Let's talk. Let's start with the future first. Uh, you know, obviously, Dune takes place twenty thousand years in the future, and it's a great vehicle for Frank Herbert to explore the evolution of humanity and the evolution of mankind. Um, and and in similar ways, um, other authors have have done this projection into the future as well, right? And, and what you get from that is this ability to, um, let's say, echo the changes that we see from the past. Let's look at it this way. The now is the future of history, right? So if we, if we put ourselves back 300 years ago and then we do that projection forward and we say, oh, wow, back in the 1700s, things were this way. You know, there were no cars or no planes or no or on horseback. Um, we're just discovering certain things in science. And then we project forward. Look, we're talking to each other uh, on the internet. I'm recording this on a device and broadcasting it to the world, as opposed to we used to have printing presses even just 600 years ago, something like this, right? So the idea of this projecting forward allows an author to explore maybe some topics that are interested or, or, or run with um, some topics. And you can see that Herbert definitely does this with um, his, his projections into what the future resistance to artificial intelligence could be. Uh, and he doesn't go into the trope of uh, you know, the, the rise of the AI as much as he goes into it's already past the rise of the AI and humanity has sort of taken this transhumanist or uh, human first approach in a way where we've become the technology. Right? And so I think that this is a great place to start to show where uh, the psychology of the future in general is a place where we can uh, explore the human potential, right? This is why these great futurist writers, even if you go back to H.G. Wells or um, uh, looking at the idea of the advancements of science, for example, has been a huge one, or the advancements of consciousness, or, or what would an alien civilization look like, or even look at the foundation of Asimov, right? Where the idea is, um, how could we extend that model, right? Uh, interestingly, not only does Dune project us in a narrative way into the future, but it also deals with this concept of prophecy, right? So now there's another angle to this. So um, in a way, the author is being a prophet for us readers, but then within his world, within a world, his future within, you know, the timeline of the world building, let's call it, he also introduces a character who wrestles with prophecy. So what's prophecy? Prophecy is the knowing of the future. Right? So here you have a book that takes place in the future. So it's already projected all of us forward into the future. And what do we find there in the future? We find a leader rising up who not only has the power of prophecy to prophesy what's going into the future, like we've all been taken on this journey forward, uh, but also 
has the access to other memory, which is a deep history. Now, this is very interesting. So while we project into the future, so let's kind of just ground this in another text, for example. Let's take a look at, so we have Dune, first of all, and we can talk about Paul's um, wrestling with prophecy. When Paul takes the water of life, for example, um, there's a moment where he is looking to the possibilities before him. You know, once he becomes the Quitsatz Heterach, let's call it, you know, what, what, will, what will that mean for the world? Like once he sets that in motion. And, and then we have this book, Jung's Aeon or Ion. And here we have some very interesting concepts. I'm just going to show you this diagram he has of this quaternary as a dynamic of the self, but it's also a map of time in a way. So now I don't know if anyone is familiar with this, but you see um, Jung sets up this pyramidal structure, this double pyramidal structure, and he has these different structures within it. And he breaks the history in his world to our real history, which would be um, in, in, in Jung's time would be a, he's, he's marking the idea of the rise of Christianity, let's say, as a, as a huge influencer of the progression of history. So again, if we were to look back at, let's think of great empires, right? We think of great empires like the Roman Empire. Right, the Roman Empire wasn't always before there wasn't a Roman Empire. So if we go back to before the Roman Empire, right? So if we do the historical um, traveling, let's say, projecting, we project back into time and we say, oh, before there was a Greek Empire. And then mostly the, the work done by the, Green, uh, the Greek Empire led to some uh, ability to... Uh, create a Roman Empire from that. And then yet right in that Roman Empire's establishing itself, we have this rise of Christianity. Again, maybe the Roman Empire helped to establish the Christian aeon. So what we kind of have in Dune is a similar thing where, you know, you've got the big events of the guild inventing uh, the ability to fold space, which opens us up to a thousand worlds. And then the Bene Gesserit breeding program, which is looking for ways to advance the human. And then finally, all of this culminates in this Christ-like event of, of Paul uh, as a prophet of this long prophecy. And in, in Ion, we also have this idea of the turning of the ages, right? So at this Paul event, and Paul recognizes it, the universe will begin to change, right? and the time will begin to change. So part of the psychology of the future, prophecy, has to do with this idea of the large swaths of time um, will suddenly have their reversals and their cycles, right? And now we're getting back into um, not only some of the warnings that Herbert has, for example, when Dune moves to Dune Messiah, we see the inversion of the hero. Right, so that same hero who brought about the fall of the Shaddam's empire is now uh, cast out into the desert and becomes sort of a mad, blind prophet. Right, so he has he goes from the highest to the lowest. Right, something like this, and I think these inversions, you know, what what Jung's Ion kind of talks about as well is these turning of the ages and this balancing of, you know, the let's say the Christ force and what he'll call is sort of more of a satanic force, you know, so it's a balancing of these forces as the ages progress. But now it's not the only writer to project into the future, right? There's lots of futurist writing, but let's take a look at that flipped on its head. Like it's interesting if we look at the reverse of this, when we look back into history and, you know, I'm a huge fan of Lovecraft, right? So with Lovecraft, he comes up with this idea of the great old ones projecting backwards before memory into a deep ancient history, right? So here we have an inverted, 
And I'm going to give you this visual again from Jung, right? We have, we have Lovecraft projecting back into an infinitely forgotten fat past. And you have Herbert not only projecting us into the future, but then having a prophet who can see even further in that future. And now you sort of see this timeline. You can even move it this way or this way, where the future has an axis forward and the past has an axis backwards. And yet there's this um, fractal nature to it, almost reminiscent of the Nietzschean uh, eternal recurrence of the same, right? So you've got this idea of empires will rise and fall. Um, the history will rise and fall. And yet, huge swaths of time, 2,000 years, you know, can an, an Egyptian empire can rise and fall over 5,000 years and then only be evidenced by pyramids in the sand and some hieroglyphics. Where, where is it? Where did it go? And then if we project back to, through that, as Lovecraft would do, where is it? One of the great things in the later Dune books, and something we explored in, in Dune Revenant, is, uh, you know, in the God Emperor books, it's almost like another aeon happens. This is, and it's very, it's also very foundation-like, and it's also very Jungian, in the sense of Leto as God Emperor. He decides that he will be that tyrannical that tyrannical aeon for a new age of the dune universe that will allow that pressure of tyranny will allow humanity to even further improve themselves right and this is a lot what jung is talking about in the phenomenology of the self right so the idea of the phenomenology of the self as you can see this is the idea is the christ event was so huge because humanity needed to understand some things about rising, raising the unconscious, understanding the shadow by making it conscious, right? Now, here we go. Now we're in that space of other memory, right? So again, another topic of Dune is access to the ancestral memories. You know, and you have... Uh, where Lovecraft, it always comes out in a horrific way, right? Lovecraft will always say, oh, the gibbering minds, the sleeping Cthulhu under the ocean, you know, maybe a real yes sunken will rise one day. So it's kind of got this real dread, a very existential dread in Lovecraft around the, um, the weight of the unconscious being made conscious, right? So this is a, a psychological journey. This is an integration that is difficult, right? It's very difficult to do that. If we flip this story a bit, it, it, cartoonishly almost, but it's, it's relevant. Let's look at the way Robert E. Howard covers history, right? Because Howard, in his, Howard wrote some backstory. Again, let's think of it as an author. Herbert writes some future backstories and projects these ages of the future. Howard wrote a piece called The Hyborian Age, right? In which he loosely mixes these pre-cataclysmic age, which is, you know, before the flood. And he talks about the sinking of Atlantis and he th talks about the sinking of Lemuria and then the way the Atlanteans moved uh, across the lands. And so he has this kind of deep history. You know, we have Tolkien does this too. Tolkien's, uh, let me pull it up here. Tolkien's Silmarillion. Uh, Tolkien's Silmarillion, again, an epic backstory to the Lord of the Rings that goes almost biblical, but it's an elven Bible. It's a Bible of Middle Earth. It's the creation of the world. And then all the ages that were forgotten um, through time to reach where we are now. And what's interesting to me with the, with the Conan Hyborian Age historical view, and again, now we're overlapping with Herbert's other memories. Who can imagine those Benny Gesserit with their other memory able to go back and know all the history? And here you have an author, Robert E. Howard, who may be influenced by none other than Madame Blavatsky, right? So H.P. Blavatsky, Helena Blavatsky, wrote about these ancient 
times, the prehistory uh, when Atlantis, before Atlantis sunk, but even before Atlantis, Lemuria or Mu, where our, perhaps we weren't as physically incarnate as we are now. Perhaps we were more of a beings of light, which again, seems Tolkien ends up in this space, right? Tolkien ends up in this space of elven, uh, you know, the race of Gandalf, for example, or the, the high elves uh, being much more, they're immortal, they're, they're between the ages, something like this. So what we, what we see here, uh, so you know, we started out talking about the future and projecting forward, but now we have authors projecting backwards. What's interesting is we find ourselves in a similar place. What does Isis Unveiled have for us? Oh, the pre-Atlantean civilization, super high technology, um, something that was forbidden, Right, we have Frank Herbert's Butlerian Jihad, super high technology. Something was forbidden. We have ages of crisis. Right, we have these Egyptian kind of migrations from Atlantis to the world. We have the God Emperor of Dune restricting travel. We have a lot of this blurring of all these these themes, these Jungian themes. Right, we have rises of ages. We have. Lovecraft's projections that in the future the stars will be right, right? A kind of a prophecy, right? And, and then oddly enough, all of this takes us to a very, very strange place, which is, maybe we'll wrap up here, is somehow, and again, this is the cyclical nature of Ion, we start seeing how these, you know, we start off with Dune, we project forward into the future history. But then by, by nature of it, we're looking back to ancient history. And then we're trying to extend past the limits of futurism, s s extend past the limits of prehistory. Uh, and what we find is, as I mentioned before, there's this Nietzschean return, return, eternal recurrence. Um, what we find in Dick is very interesting because it's very symptomatic we talk about the psychology of the future because Dick does both, right? So Philip K. Dick, as you guys know, uh, do androids, dream, electronic, sheep, Valis, Ubik, uh, Minority Report, lots of futuristic sci-fi things. But also Dick's exegesis was one of these books. Uh, and, and part of it you see in Valis, uh, he had explored some of this in Timothy Archer. So some of this... Some of these notes, notebooks of his, uh, were a speculation into Gnosticism. So again, we're back to Gnosticism, right? Uh, who's more Gnostic than the God Emperor Leto II, right? A tyrant who installs himself uh, as a demiurge over all of humanity until humanity comes to a point where they can overcome him, right? So Dick mad historical trick that he plays on himself maybe and on us uh, is you know so as you guys may know or may not know so Philip K. Dick had a, a bad I think a bad toothache of some sort or some abscess tooth and he had some surgery and back in uh, 1974 he's waiting for the chemist from the pharmacy to come with uh, his prescription, some pain meds, and they were wearing the Christian, this Christian fish symbol, sort of like this cover, as a necklace. And the light, the sunlight, when the, he opened the door to get his delivery of medicine from the, the bag, uh, the sunlight caught the necklace of the delivery person, and it beamed this pinkish purple light into his eye. And Dick felt like he was having a, a, a religious experience, like information was being downloaded into his brain. And you guys can check this stuff out on, you know, Dick talking about simulated worlds and things like that. There's this famous uh, speech where he talks about that. But Dick went on to write this amazing set of notes in which he talks about 
maybe we're still living in Roman times. Maybe the, all of history is just like a hologram and that nothing has really changed. It's still like the Christ event. It's a very Gnostic book. It's a very, it's a very meltdown-y, schizophrenic, chernobyl uh, book. Um, but it, it sort of is wrestling with that exact same shadow wrestling. But here, here is Dick taking on almost all of history, all of time, all of the way we know how time flows. And he, uh, I'll, I'll, I'm going to do a, a month on Philip K. Dick. So if you guys are interested in the exegesis, I will definitely get into that. But I think w what's interesting for us here is you sort of see this merging in Dick of the two opposites. So just as Jung tried to describe it as the age is turning, you know, um, Howard talks about the Hyborian age and then the coming of Conan. It's just to sort of show this unfolding of history like the prehistory when magic still was alive and there were sorcerers and devils and 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 and, and uh, Howard uses it in a fantasy sword and sorcery kind of device it's almost like he cribs some interesting things from Blavatsky that he borrows a little bit from Blavatsky to make an exciting world building for his Conan uh, saga and, and listen Lovecraft does the same thing but Lovecraft takes the fear psychological fear of the deep history and uses that for his world building. And Herbert does a, a similar thing. He not only projects into the future, but he has other memory projecting back to the past. And then you've got this Ouroboros almost. You've got this snake eating its own tail. And again, when we go back to the idea of uh, closing the circle, uh, you see that there is a kind of world snake here, a world serpent, a mandala that the Anthropos, this Ouroboros gives the following. You see the Anthropos or Rotundum and the serpents and the Lapis and the Sapiens, the, the Homo Sapien, right? So this kind of circular rotation of the, the circular rotation of time. Time is a circular component, right? And you see it in medieval religious art. You see this in, in Jung talking about this quaternio, right? You even see this circular point where it starts to talk about it. And you see this is a chemical equation. So these chemical circles. It's, it's interesting how uh, you see it in the I Ching. You know, Jung talks about the I Ching where it's, the world is a block to be traversed in time and folded, folded through time. So conclusions, where do we go from this? So, I mean, obviously there's so much we could talk about here, but I just wanted to introduce the idea here of, um, you know, when, when Herbert starts looking at the idea of future prophecy, you know, maybe we'll wrap up in like, in a psychological way, just to say it this way, what, what are we doing when we look to the future? Well, we're looking to better ourselves, right? We're looking to, to play out a scenario, right? You know, uh, there's a, a classic uh, sort of like that Deleuzian rhizome stuff, right? So the idea of the potential, the realness of potential, right? So the idea is um, if we project ourselves into the future, we get to see how something will play out, right? So it helps us with our discernment and it helps to take the fears out of it, right? Um, so what you see with, with a writer a writer wants to create a, a worldview, right? So you see Lovecraft will actually play on the fears. Lovecraft will take the part, psychological part of what if there's a deep forgotten history and there's something scary back there, right? And that scary thing back there is our own coming to grips with our shadow, right? And for Lovecraft, he just projects it forward almost in a, in a Steiner way. We've talked a bit before on in other podcasts about uh, Rudolf Steiner. Steiner's uh, The Angel Mark Michael, the Archangel Mike and Michael, his mission and ours, is very interesting in this note. So you have Lovecraftian fear and you have Jungian shadow work, right? And then there's a, an odd, you know, we know Jung's Wotan lecture. But there's this odd place with the Steiner Archangel Michael work, which talks about talks about the idea of 
yes, we can do shadow work for ourselves in a Jungian term. We can work on ourselves. You know, we can have personal improvement, let's just call it. Let's just simplify it as that. And then we can even take on a cause, right? Um, the lots of trash in the neighborhood. You get the neighborhoods neighbors together and you clean up your neighborhood. There's a, you know, you plant gardens in your neighborhood. So now that the neighborhood creates a vibe and everybody kind of follows this vision, right? So you sort of do the shadow work of your neighborhood, right? You, I remember that there was a guy who was filling potholes on his street because the town ran out of budget and he would fill his own potholes, right? right? This is something like this, right? The idea of taking into your own hands the betterment of things. But what Steiner brings up in the Archangel Michael is as we go out from uh, improving the self and improving the, you know, our, our, our friends and family and, and taking on these world causes, you know, world hunger, you know, um, uh, health, uh, uh, equity, right? Um, the gap in the wealthy and the poor, right? Finding a better system that works for everyone, right? These kind of challenges as they get bigger, we bump up against something that Steiner talks about is like, well, there is, you know, and back to the Jung question, there is Christ and there's Satan in the sense of, well, maybe evil, if we believe spiritually that evil is real, eventually you will come to an evil shadow so large that you do not have the power or the ability to conquer it. It will just consume you. And again, back to Nietzsche, he talks about, you know, looking into the abyss and the abyss looking back into you, that kind of thing. But there's hope because what Steiner talks about in the Archangel Michael is, well, there is someone who can help redeem all evil. And that's the angels and God. So the idea is, this is a sort of an argument for when you get an evil that's so big, uh, there still is a bigger force that can take that on, right? So it's something like this happens in, even in our fiction worlds, right? You have, um, you have the idea of, in Dune, the God Emperor, Leto II, is thinking about this huge world shadow work and it ta he takes it upon his shoulders where Paul may have escaped a bit and just became a mad monk. His son Leto, by becoming a 2,000 year worm tyrant, um, embodies all the evil so that the humanity will rise above it. So he's sort of like taking this epic sacrifice, almost like a Christ-like sacrifice to, to, to build this up, right? So we have that kind of concept of what the future speculation is for, right? When, when we see it in world building, when we see it in Lovecraft's world building, it's sort of like, let's use fear to illustrate those heroic journeys. When we see it in uh, Howard's world building, we see let's use it as a place where magic can still happen, where there's threats and where the world that we thought we knew is mysterious. But when we get to Dune and Herbert, uh, what we see is, a huge critique and a huge insight into the potential of humanity, right? Uh, the potentials of humanity and the risks of humanity, right? So we see, you see him taking it in both directions. And some of those themes get explored even in Dune Revenant, where we take a look at even an even further future. And, and this will maybe we'll end up on this concept because when we project into Frank's world far enough, eventually, we start seeing the dehumanization of people, right? People become to become dehumanized. You know, you see it also in the work of Steiner when he talks about the Arimonic age, right? Some of the things that Dick struggled with were the dehumanization of people. You know, we see, we see Dick as a science fiction writer, but Dick is also very much a political writer. And it's a political writer out of that Berkeley, California time where he was coming up where it was a lot of social social change happening. So a lot of times when we see Dick, what's great about Dick is this at, in the same breath where it's science, science fiction critique, it's social critique, right? And, and the Arimonic forces that maybe Steiner will talk about also seem to have a political thing. It's like, what does it mean to be human, right? What does it mean to be human? And that's one of the topics, you know, maybe we'll end up with this. When we bring future speculation as a betterment for ourselves or a projection of ourselves. How can we do that shadow work? How can we, how can we um, improve ourselves? Looking to the future is one way we do that. Looking to the past history is, is one way is like, what are our origins? How did we get this way? 
And when we have frightful and fearful pasts and hidden histories, again, it's the unconscious where, oh, I didn't realize I'm still being programmed by this deep history, right? So these are, these are both psychologically looking to the future and looking to the deep past are, are a eternal heroic journey, you know, psychologically in a Jungian way of transformation, origins, and futures, right? Uh, again, the, 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 the warning maybe that comes out of the Dune Revenant book was, it said, let's project Frank Herbert's future even further, even further. We already started to see by the Dune period that the Bene Gesserit weren't, didn't seem so nice, right? The Tleilaxu and their axolotl tanks, not so friendly, right? The, some of these directions of the evolution of these human transhumanists become quite inhuman in a way, you know, we're dehumanized, right? And the very same uh, forces, and again, we go back to Steiner here, the very same forces of, we'll call them Luciferian forces, that gave rise to science and gave rise to this, uh, the genius of the, uh, the illumination of enlightenment become the shackles of a, a demonic um, imprisonment. You know, Dick talks about the world as the black iron prison, right? He calls it the, the BIP, the black iron prison. And, the, and Steiner talks about the arimonic forces, which what? They seek to dehumanize. They seek to marginalize. They make us cogs in a Gnostic nightmare. So what, what happens in Dune Revenant is there are a kind of historian that uses the spice not to project into the future, but to try to remember through spice dreaming an ancient past when we were more human, right? Some of that humanity has been slip, stripped away. Some of that individuality had been handed over generation after generation, like Gibbon's fall of the Roman Empire, uh, in a slow descent from civilization into, um, you know, into, I mean, similar to the foundation by Asimov, right, into a long um, period of a, a regression period. So we can see, you know, something akin to the grades, let's call it, in Dune Revenant, which are these ones with many faces. There's the face dancers that have advanced beyond humanity. They're a hive mind. They're looking out into the, into the, into the past. And then you've got the spice dreamers who are the, you know, the, the descendants of humanity or the, uh, the, the children of humanity far in the future, seeking what humanity means. Right? So they're looking to the past to find humanity. They're looking to the future to find what humanity is. Right? And so you see their struggle is to prove that Paul was real. And they do this by their spice dreaming. And then they find that maybe there's a secret, a secret in the anthropos. Right? We'll call it the anthropos. Right? But we'll just call that humanity, maybe just to be correct. The, the human element, uh, the personality, let's call it, the personality of um, uh, the spiritual source, not as an impersonal force, not as a machine force, not even as waves of history or projected future, but as a relation between the inner self and each other, right? So this is sort of probably a good place to stop. But um, hey, if you like what we're doing here, please um, please like and subscribe. Uh, we'll be doing, uh, like I said, I mentioned a Philip K. Dick uh, podcast. Would love to do more Dune. Uh, I'm, I'm really thinking that a Dune, God Emperor of Dune series, maybe a month of podcast on God Emperor of Dune will be, will be good. Um, I want to continue pulling in Steiner, uh, Jung, uh, interesting. Would also like to do a Tolkien, Tolkien one because there's a lot of rich things in Tolkien. But I think maybe Philip K. Dick will come come next with a sci-fi month, continuing uh, as the Dune movie approaches. I'll probably get into some Dune ones. Uh, but let me know in the comments below if you guys would like to see anything special. Uh, any comments that you have on this? Super interested. Let's get a conversation going. 
uh, help me build the channel. If you can join on the Patreon, check out the Dune Revenant book, all of those things help, but mostly helping by uh, your comments, your subscriptions, sharing. Let's get this out to people so we can start um, having a conversation together with like-minded people and uh, looking to talk to you guys in the comments in the Patreon and talk to you soon. Thanks for listening and bye-bye.